So now we continue learning from his huge competence and experience, since he's going to be the moderator of the next panel session, focused on negotiation and mediation of cultural property disputes. So Professor Scovazzi will introduce the speakers. Thank you. Now I will turn to English, considering that uh, three out of four of the speakers are non-Italian speakers. And uh, the subject of this panel, panel is uh, negotiation and mediation for the settlement of disputes uh, relating to cultural uh, properties. Negotiation, we have many examples of negotiations, some um, of them successful, others non-successful. Uh, but uh, as regards mediation, we have very few cases of mediation. So maybe one pending question is why we need instruments for mediation and conciliation while we have uh, so few cases of uh, states uh, uh, available for mediation. Is there a need or not? I in any case, we have here four experts. Uh, I will give them, it is my irrevocable decision, not more than 20 minutes for their interventions because uh, I want to leave also some time for the discussion, which is uh, as uh, stimulating as uh, the intervention. So our first uh, uh, speaker is uh, Mr. Tural Mustafayev. He works uh, with uh, UNESCO, the world institution in charge inter alia of culture, of the protection of culture. UNESCO has uh, promoted at least uh, six cultural uh, conventions, one relating also to the restitution of cultural uh, properties. And Mr. Mustafayev is Associate Program Specialist in the Culture and Emergency Entity of uh, the UNESCO culture sector. Please, you, you have the floor. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor. Uh, first of all, on behalf of UNESCO, uh, let me extend my sincere gratitude to the Chamber of uh, uh, Commerce of Florence and the uh, Permanent Court of Arbitration for putting together uh, this important topic and bringing us here uh, to Florence. Um, I'm responsible officer for UNESCO's global program on protection of cultural property in times of armed conflict. Uh, to be more precise, I work for, uh, I advise for the implementation of the 1954 Hague Convention and its two protocols. Uh, the part of uh, our work relates to the prevention of illicit trafficking of cultural property from countries in conflict. So today I won't specifically speak about the dispute settlement per se, but instead I will reflect on how international rules govern the protection of cultural heritage in times of armed conflict, uh, what are the problems, how we try to address them, and how these problems lead to international disputes. I'm not going to go into details of each convention because uh, in the morning we had some speakers who already touched on certain aspects, but I will try to give a, a general overview. So uh, the conflicts are bad, and they destroy economies, they dysfunction state institutions, they create safe havens for criminal activities, all facilitating the damage and destruction of cultural heritage. There is nothing new about this. In fact, uh, in fact as an international community, we, have, uh, we were able to adopt a number of international treaties a hundred years ago uh, trying to address this problem. But the problem is today's conflicts are different. The means of war, wars are different. The parties of wars are different. So let me show you some of the photos uh, from, uh, taken from recent conflict. 
This photo uh, is taken from uh, in Mali in 2012 after uh, the internal conflict. You see uh, the head of museum that holds uh, the burned ma manuscripts. Uh, thousands of manuscripts were burned as a result of uh, the conflict. Um, the second photo is from Mosul in Iraq. Do uh, you see uh, the min minaret of uh, Al Habda, uh, Al Nuri Mosque, and it destroyed completely, and also city is destroyed completely as a result of a conflict. And the third photo is from uh, Syria. You see uh, there are holes. Uh, this is a satellite image that we took. Uh, we worked with U uh, UN satellite. Uh, you see the holes on uh, the archaeological site. These are holes digged by ISIS. They, they excavated uh, uh, the archaeological site and they sold the artifacts in, in the black market. These are just a few photos from, from the conflicts of recent years. All these conflicts, uh, uh, all this conflict, destabilization, paved the way for illegal excavations, as you see, and theft and illicit trafficking of cultural property. Uh, this stable environment is also exacerbated by profitable business incentives. Uh, let's see some figures. For example, uh, in 2016, art market generated about 45 billion uh, of global sales, up to 1.7% uh, compared to 2015, and this figure is even higher today. According to UNADC, uh, the cost of trans, uh, transnational crime related to art and cultural property, it's about uh, the crime, now is between 3.4 and $6.3 billion. Between March 2003 and 2005, 400,000 to 600,000 antiquities have been looted from Iraq, generating between 10 million to 20 million, uh, the profit. And it's estimated that ISIS alone raised about 200 million a year from cultural looting. And this figure is from 2015. As you see, the art is a big business. I mean here illicit trafficking of art. It's not only about destroying identity of communities or erasing the memory uh, through taking away their cultural heritage, but it's also a security issue. And it's a serious problem that we have to tackle. To this effect, we have a number of treaties that we have mentioned uh, during the during the, uh, the morning session. Uh, the first one is uh, the 1954 Hague Convention for the Protection of Cultural Property in Times of Armed Conflict and its two protocols. And then we have uh, recommendations uh, on uh, international principles applicable for uh, archaeological excavations. Then we have 1970 Convention on Illicit Trafficking of Cultural Property. We have 1995 Unidra Convention. And uh, we have uh, Council of Europe Convention on F Offenses Related to Cultural Property. These are uh, the most prominent uh, the treaties uh, that exist today. Uh, 1954 Hague Convention is, is probably the, it's the first international treaty uh, uh, with a worldwide vocation focusing exclusively on the protection of cultural property in times of armed conflict. It was adopted after the Second World War as a response to the atrocities committed during the, the, the big war. So uh, today we have 133 state parties to the Hague Convention. And its first protocol, we have 110 and 82 state parties to the second protocol. And it's uh, UNESCO as a secretary of this convention. We, it's one of our priorities to expand the number of state parties. You can see uh, the maps uh, for Hague Convention, for example. It's uh, m quite a number of uh, countries, even uh, the main military powers ratified the 1954 Hague Convention. Uh, then we have first protocol and second protocol is relatively less. And uh, this year we are, we are celebrating the 20th anniversary of the second protocol. And today we have only two permanent members of Security Council, uh, UK and France that are parties to this uh, the protocol, the rest still uh, are pending. Under 1954 Hague Convention, uh, the definition of cultural property covers movable and immovable cultural property. It, Article 1 of the convention lists uh, non-exhaustive list of uh, the, uh, the objects that may be considered as, a, uh, as a cultural property. These are 
monuments of architecture, art or history, archaeological sites, work of art, manuscripts, books, and etc. Definition of cultural property is indeed one of the, the problems uh, that lies to, to settle disputes, and also not only national dispute, but also international uh, dispute as, disputes as well. We as a UNESCO receive national reports every four years from states and how they implement the convention. And one of the things that we check is how they define uh, cultural property. Uh, and you, it's all the reports are uh, online, and if you try to check them, you will see that each country has a different approach. Uh, some is narrow, some is quite broad, and it affects also criminal proceedings when uh, in some country, uh, looting one object may be uh, interpreted as a looting a cultural property, in another country it will be a civilian uh, object. And it's also in international level. For example, Rome Statute, uh, under Rome Statute, Article 8, uh, directing attacks against historical buildings may amount to war crime, but Rome Statute do not, do, does not cover um, uh, movable cultural property. The photo that you saw, uh, one of the first slides that burned manuscripts, uh, when uh, International Criminal Court uh, considered the case against Al Mahdi, they did not take uh, the burn, burning of manuscripts. They uh, only uh, uh, covered the jurisdiction over destroyed immovable sites. So this is one of the problems, and uh, the, trying to to uh, to uh, to uh, encourage states and to have consistent legislation, not only in, in the European level or international level, it's it's very very important. And 19, under 1954 Hague Convention, it's um, the protection means the safeguarding and respect. So convention is not only covering the, the protection of uh, the heritage in times of armed conflict, but it lists down a number of measures that need to be taken in peacetime. So we call it safeguarding, the peacetime measures. And respect for cultural property uh, is uh, in, 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 in times of armed conflict. And in fact, 1954K Convention is the only UNESCO convention which is a part of international humanitarian law. So it's uh, and it's it's the, the most comprehensive treaty governing cultural property in in, in IHL. And under 54 convention, we have three levels of protection. Uh, the convention says that all cultural properties are protected, so they are under general protection. We have uh, the special protection, which number of limited sites have been inscribed to this list, uh, and then we have enhanced protection under. Uh, the second protocol. And last year, Library of Florence uh, was inscribed to enhance protection list. And we do, as a UNESCO, give priority for enhanced protection list because it is the list um, that states come with their cultural properties. And with uh, the declaration, usually signed by Minister of Defense or the defense uh, entity, uh, taking obligation on behalf of state that they will never use this site for military purposes or they will never do a training, they will never uh, put a training facilities next to this site, etc. So last year, uh, the Library of Florence was the first non-World Heritage site inscribed to the list. Now we have uh, the 17 sites from 10 countries, but we are reviewing uh, the inscription process and we hope to have more and more sites each year. You see the photo from, uh, this photo taken from, from Azerbaijan is one of the enhanced protection site places. Uh, it's an archaeological site, and uh, this is the logo of enhanced protection. And then this is uh, the blue shield logo um, uh, painted on the roof of uh, the Baghdad Museum uh, during the 2003 conflict. The museum staff painted this when the US uh, Air Force started uh, the striking the city just to inform them that this is a cultural site. And uh, Protocol 1 is probably the, the, uh, the Protocol 1 to the Hague Convention is probably the, the one instrument that deals with mostly with um, the, uh, the illicit trafficking of uh, the cultural property, but it covers uh, its scope limited to the occupation only. And I will not go through the different uh, different uh, the provisions of this protocol, but in general, it's prohibited for occupying po power to take uh, the artifacts or cultural property from occupied territory. And the, all uh, the state parties they have an obligation to assist uh, the national authorities to in occupied uh, the area to protect the cultural sites. Um, 
However, 1954 uh, Hague Convention has two protocols. They do not address to illegal excavations, which is a quite important subject when we talk about illicit trafficking of art. Uh, for this, after two, year, uh, two years after the adoption of 54 Convention, uh, the, under UNESCO auspices, states adopted recommendations for, uh, on international principles ap applicable to archaeological excavations. The number of recommendations under, uh, under this uh, the document and it's not obligatory, it's, uh, it's recommendation, but quite a number of states, they have, uh, they have incorporated those recommendations into their national legislation. And then we have, of course, 1970 Convention, which is the most comprehensive treaty when we talk about illicit export, import, and transport of ownership of uh, cultural property. Under 1970 Convention, we have preventive measures. It covers return and restitution, and it has uh, provisions on international cooperation. For example, as a preventive measures, uh, educational campaigns, national inventories, export certificates, laws on protection of cultural property, and etc. These are the these are the measures that states are asked to take. And as a UNESCO, we do give a priority for for preventive measures because most of the time, settling disputes are more time consuming, and the preventing preventing measures, in fact, uh, really can facilitate. At the dis dispute level, if you have this export certificate, the proper uh, proper documentation, it can also help uh, the the courts and national uh, uh, or courts of different arbitration uh, arbitration courts at international level to settle this dispute. So we do work with states to put in place these preventive measures. Then uh, 1970 Convention also talks about restitution. It's not retroactive, so it means it will not apply to uh, the colonial heritage, which happened uh, before 1970. And uh, the request should be made through only through diplomatic channels, and the state must provide an evidence, is, is evidence which, is, which is important. And then just compensation is also, um, also uh, mentioned under 1970 convention, and it only applies to invented, invented objects. So, uh, are called, uh, illegally um, clandestine excavations that uh, are not uh, the artifacts coming from clandestine excavations that are not usually uh, inventories they will not fall under the 1970 convention and uh, it has number of provisions on international cooperation which is uh, which is the which convention promotes as a main tool for 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 uh, the solving problems on uh, the return and restitution then we have the Inter Intergovernmental Committee for Return and Institution, it's ICP, RCP, and uh, I believe the next speaker will talk more about this. And uh, this is under UNESCO auspices, and this, uh, this is, uh, in fact, one of the mediation mechanisms uh, available at international level. So, uh, and we have UNIDUA Convention on stolen, uh, uh, on stolen and illegally exported objects. Um, it's not UNESCO Convention, but uh, the preparation of the Convention was asked by UNESCO, and it was adopted in 1995. And uh, it, it includes a number of measures for, uh, for uh, solving uh, the disputes uh, at national level, and also some, uh, some provisions about uh, 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 um, uninvented objects. So I will not go into details about this convention, and uh, if there will be any question, I will be happy to respond. And uh, yeah, and uh, but the, the, there is an international law that, uh, in certain extent, uh, that covers uh, that tries to prevent illicit trafficking of cultural property. But there are many loopholes and weaknesses of international legislation, sometimes also impeded by political motives. The fake documentation for cultural properties uh, brought to auction houses is no less common. The sale of artifacts in black market happens almost every day. Even in eBay and Facebook, you can, you can go and find uh, the sale of illegally obtained the cultural objects. And uh, uh, at UNESCO, we put, uh, as I said, we put more emphasis on the preventive measures and we try to work with eBay and uh, Facebook when we see this kind of ads to take them down and uh, with national authorities if there is a, the jurisdiction over a people which is most of the time is anonymous and you cannot identify the, the, the owner of this kind of ads. Now I want to conclude but I don't want to 
conclude on negative notes because uh, talking about the law and legislation and then loopholes and weaknesses sometimes uh, creates um, the, the negative message. Um, in fact, I believe, uh, I believe as an international community we are moving forward. Today, uh, international community is more sensitive and more responsive to damage and destruction of cultural pr properties than any time before. We see, we see more donors are coming to contribute for projects that are for protection of cultural property. Traditionally, it was Italy, uh, the Netherlands, and most of the European countries that were leading uh, this race. But now, more, uh, quite a number of the Gulf states, Asian states, are, are new actors and uh, the new donors. And this shows the, commitment, the scope of commitment is expanding. And uh, if you remember these photos, for example, I showed you in the beginning, this is uh, the photo from Mali. And we were able to recover uh, after uh, the conflict. Uh, remaining uh, the manuscripts were recovered thanks to the contribution of the states. We have uh, inventorized all remaining manuscripts. They are more secure in the more secure situation than they were before. Uh, but unfortunately, we lost uh, a quite a number of them. And another one is uh, this photo. You remember uh, the minaret is destroyed. I just a uh, couple days ago, uh, we have started uh, rebuilding it again, and uh, the minaret will be, we hope that in a couple of years, uh, the cultural sites in Mosul, especially the mosque, uh, will be uh, recovered fully to its original uh, state. And uh, in this kind of conferences, we often, when we speak and we share experience, experience about cultural property destruction, we tend to put focus on more on perpetrators of crimes, uh, giving no credit for, for those who made sacrifices for heritage. We often tend to forget their stories. So that's why whenever I do a presentation, I always try to add one story, uh, the person who really committed the cultural property in order to, give, uh, the put, to shed some light on uh, the, uh, the sacrifice. And this time I chose um, uh, Khalid Assad, maybe you, most of you probably you saw him. He is a, he was one of the uh, the Syrian archaeologists, and he wrote a lot about the Palmyra. And it's in fact it's impossible to read and to write something about Palmyra without referring to his studies and his work. And in 2015, uh, when Palmyra was captured by ISIS, he was asked to 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 reveal the hidden uh, the objects in the Palmyra. And he refused, and then he was uh, he was beheaded in the main square of Palmyra. But uh, it's uh, the people like uh, him, people like Khalid, who motivate the international community, who motivate everyone work, who works in this uh, field to move uh, forward. Thank you very much, and I will be happy to answer to any question. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Mustafaev. You emphasized that uh, in time of war, we have two dangers for cultural heritage. First, uh, destruction as a result of war events or contempt of the culture of another people. And then we have also the danger of illegal trafficking. You put cultural properties on the market to earn money from them. In the case of illegal trafficking, we have two subjects involved, the seller <coughs> and the buyer. Maybe the buyer is in another country far away, but I would say that he is equally responsible from the criminal point of view. And we have UNESCO instruments uh, that have been put in place in order to fight against uh, illegal uh, trafficking. So thank you very much. The, the duration of your intervention was 20 minutes and uh, 17 seconds. Uh, and uh, good. Yes. You, Almost perfection, almost, almost perfection, yes. 
Good. Uh, uh, our second uh, speaker is uh, Mrs. Uh, Artemis Papatanasiu. She is uh, a lawyer and uh, the senior legal advisor of the Minister of Foreign Affairs in Athens, uh, Greece. She is uh, involved in many negotiations and international uh, meetings, uh, especially at uh, UNESCO questions of uh, protection and restitution of cultural uh, properties. Uh, incidentally, it seems to me that Greece uh, is involved in some notable questions of restitution of cultural properties. Maybe she could also tell us something about uh, this uh, kind of question. So, Thank you very much. You have the floor. Thank you, Professor Scovazzi. Uh, distinguished participants, signore e signori, vorrei innanzitutto esprimere i miei più sinceri ringraziamenti alla Camera di Commercio di Firenze per avermi invitato a partecipare in questa importante conferenza. Illegal activities against... Sorry, I tried to... Okay. Illegal activities against cultural property, such as theft, damage, clandestine excavations, in intentional destruction, illicit transfer or trade are not a new phenomenon. Throughout history, armed conflicts, annexations, colonial domination, but also artistic and aesthetic curiosity, as well as the development of illegal commercial networks, have resulted respect respectively in the lost or displacement of cultural properties, which in most cases symbolized the cultural identity of the respective nations. This presentation will attempt at highlighting the current evolutionary trends and subsequent developments with regard to return or restitution of cultural property to the countries of origin in the context of UNESCO and the United Nations. Within UNESCO, the terms return and restitution are used in a different context. Restitution is mostly used for properties stolen from the owner, including property pillage in time of war, and in technical terms presupposes the existence of an identified recipient. Return, on the other side, is rather used for state property displaced from the country of origin during colonial domination for the benefit of the colonial power as well as for cases of unlawful export from the territory of a state. Return and restitution of stolen or displaced cultural property strictly within the context of UNESCO are mainly addressed by, first, the 1970 UNESCO Convention on the Means of Prohibiting and Preventing the Illicit Import, Export and Transfer of Ownership of Cultural Property, and second, the ICPLCP, the Intergovernmental Committee for Promoting the Return of Cultural Property to its countries of origin or its restitution in case of illicit appropriation. I would also like to clarify here that although the 1997 UNIDRA Convention deals with the same subject and is considered complementary to the 1970 Convention, I thought it best to refer exclusively to the 1970 Convention, which is concluded purely in the context of UNESCO. The 1970 UNESCO Convention constitutes undoubtedly the major UNESCO international instrument on fighting the looting and illicit trafficking in cultural property by implementing preventive measures, establishing cooperation between source and market nations, and promoting return and restitution of cultural property to the countries of origin. The fundamental provisions relating to return and restitution are set out in Article 7 of the Convention, Inspired, among others, by the principle that it is incumbent upon every state to protect the cultural property existing within its national territory against the dangers of theft, clandestine excavation and illicit export, the Convention covers only cases falling under its scope of application and concerns property that is specifically designated by each state as being of importance for archaeology, prehistory, history, literature, art or science. In addition, the 1970 Convention has no self-executing effect, and as is also the case with any international convention, it has no re retra retroactive force in accordance with the relevant principle of public international law as embodied in Article 28 of the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties, namely the non-retroactivity of treaties, 
States parties to the Convention may invoke it only for cases emerged after its entry into force, while its relatively new and quite effective so far monitoring mechanism, the Subsidiary Committee, does not adopt mandatory decisions. However, it has to be underlined that several bilateral disputes on specific cultural objects have been resolved in recent years by making use of the 1970 Convention's general principles as they are further developed in the recently adopted operational guidelines for the implementation of the Convention, without any recourse to its monitoring mechanisms. The second mechanism within UNESCO is the Intergovernmental Committee for Promoting the Return of Cultural Property to its Countries of Origin or its Restitution in Case of Illicit Appropriation, the ICPLCP, which was established by the UNESCO General Conference in 1978. The ICPLCP is an independent intergovernmental body composed of 22 UNESCO member states with an advisory role responsible for the return or restitution of cultural properties removed from the countries of origin before 1970 due in principle to colonial domination. It provides a platform of negotiation, mediation and conciliation between the parties concerned and acts as a facilitator for the restitution of important cultural objects. Moreover, ICPLCP is a forum for a non-judicial settlement of disputes and may be used only in cases of failure or, or interruption of bilateral negotiations for the return or restitution of cultural properties. Among its major achievements is the adoption of the UNESCO Rules of Procedure for Mediation and Conciliation. I would also like to underline that only UNESCO member states and associate members may defer to these rules, which explicitly allow states to equally represent the interests of public or private institutions located in their territories, as well as those of their nationals. The ICPRCP adopts decisions and recommendations which are not legally binding, as the committee serves only as an advisory and not as a, as a judicial body. However, they are not devoid of moral, ethical and political value. Among requests for return which were lodged with the ICPRCP and have been resolved successfully through the committee's facilitation, I would like to indicatively men mention the most recent ones. We have here the return of the Maconde mask to Tanzania. This case was brought under the aegis of the ICPRCP in 2006 for facilitating a long-standing case concerning the restitution to Tanzania of a Maconde mask, an emblematic symbol of the Tanzanian cultural heritage illegally retained by the Barbier Müller Museum in Switzerland. In 2010, a solution was found through in principle the facilitation of the discussions by the ICPRCP. After 20 years of negotiations between the parties, the Maconde mask was returned to Tanzania. And now the return of the Boasco Sphinx to Turkey. The case of the Boasco Sphinx has been on the committee's agenda since 1987. The Boasco Sphinx was initially found in 1912 by German and Ottoman archaeologists during the excavation of the Ottoman Imperial Museum in Boasco, Turkey. The Sphinx was found in the major area of Boazkale, where was situated the former capital of the Hittite civilization and had been shipped to Germany by the German archaeological mission in Turkey between 1915 and 1917 to be cleaned and restored. But years later, it was exposed in the Berlin Museum and had featured in publications. It took many years to achieve a result. Bilateral meetings held in the two countries and the ICPRCP's facilitation led to the conclusion of a bilateral agreement between Germany and Turkey, and then on November 2011, the Sphinx was returned to Turkey by the Berlin Museum. The Parthenon sculptures, which were looted in early 19th century by the then British ambassador to the Ottoman Empire, Lord Elgin, constitutes one of the most important agenda items of the committee, lodged with it in 1984 and still pending. A recommendation of the progress of the relevant negotiations is adopted by the committee at the end of each of its sessions. Between 1984 and 2018, the committee adopted 16 recommendations on the matter. 
which among others call upon Greece and the UK to intensify their efforts with a view to reaching a satisfactory settlement of this long-standing issue while at the same time taking into account its historical, cultural, legal and ethical dimensions. For the sake of completeness, uh, it has also to be noted that in 2013, Greece submitted through UNESCO a request to the British side for proceeding to mediation by using the UNESCO rules on mediation and conciliation in order to reach a commonly acceptable solution on the matter. The UK government and the trustees of the British Museum replied two years later by emphatically refusing to engage in any mediated solution. Let's now go to the United Nations. In the context of the United Nations, return or restitution of cultural property to the countries of origin is dealt with by the UN General Assembly in principle. It is also dealt with by the Security Council, but only in what concerns illicit trafficking in cultural property during armed conflicts and its interconnection with terrorism financing. In relation to this specific aspect, I will very shortly refer to two emblematic and relatively recent Security Council resolutions, namely Resolutions 2199 of 2015 and 2347 of 2017. Resolution 2199 of 2015 represents a landmark in the recognition of the direct linkage between the destruction and pillage of cultural heritage in Iraq and Syria, particularly by Daesh, with the financing of terrorism. Most importantly, this resolution highlights the side consequences of the destruction of cultural heritage in Iraq and Syria, namely the looting of antiquities and their illicit trafficking and trade, and calls on member states to take all feasible measures in order to um, prevent terrorist groups from profiting from illicit, illicit trade of cultural goods while implying its return or restitution. A resolution 2347 of 2017, which was introduced to the Security Council on the initiative of Italy and France, constitutes the first Security Council resolution exclusively devoted to the overall issue of the protection of cultural heritage, particularly during armed conflict. Among others, it introduces in its operative part the concept of safe havens for movable cultural property in danger. In this context, it encourages member states to take preventive measures to safeguard their state-owned cultural property in a network of safe havens and undertake all appropriate efforts for the recovery of cultural heritage and consequently its return to the countries of origin. Let's now go to the UN General Assembly. Every three years, the UN General Assembly adopts a resolution entitled Return or Restitution of Cultural Property to the Countries of Origin. This resolution is consistently introduced by Greece, who is also the facilitator of the relevant negotiations within the United Nations. The resolution underlines the responsibility of states to combat illicit trafficking in cultural property during peace and wartime, in light also of the recent conflicts in the Middle East, and expresses deep concern about the loss, theft, pillage, destruction, illicit removal or misappropriation of cultural property, in particular in conflict areas, as well as about its illicit trafficking, notably through the internet. The resolution condemns the aforementioned illegal actions and calls upon states to safeguard cultural property by not only taking appropriate protection measures, but also by returning stolen or illicitly traded cultural property to the countries of origin. In the text of the December 2015 resolution in question, of a major importance is its operative paragraph 7, which for the first time, sorry, recognizes the recent institution of international conferences on the return or restitution of cultural property held respectively in Seoul, ancient Olympia, Greece, Dunhuang, China, and Nefshehir, Turkey. Similarly, in the text of the December 2018 respective resolution, the General Assembly, sorry, but I cannot move the PowerPoint. Um, Okay. Uh, in the text of the December 2018 respective resolution, the General Assembly recognizes uh, uh, for once more the institution of international conferences on the return or institution of cultural property as well as their concluding documents. 
Among them, the ancient Olympia recommendation of 2013, which calls for making use of mediation as an alternative means of dispute resolution in relation to the difference over the Parthenon's cultures. Most importantly, and this is the latest development in the context of the United Nations, through the resolution in question, the UN General Assembly commends both UNESCO and the ICPRCP on the work they have accomplished, in particular through the promotion of bilateral negotiations for the return or restitution of cultural property of fundamental spiritual, historical and cultural value, while noting the adoption by the ICPRCP of the rules of procedure on mediation and conciliation and, and inviting member states to consider the possibility of using such processes as appropriate. It is also noteworthy that uh, the said resolution, as was also the case with the 2015 respective one, was unanimously adopted, which means that not one single state among those hosting the well-known international museums, such as the UK, France, Germany, Russia, and the United States of America, made any attempt to break the consensus at the stage of the adoption of the resolution. It is apparent from the above that the UN General Assembly through the said resolution, not only aimed at illustrating the importance of making use of alternative means of dispute resolution, such as negotiations, mediation, and conciliation when dealing with cultural dispute settlement, but in addition, invited states to consider proceeding to such options. Ladies and gentlemen, in light of the above developments in the context of UNESCO and the UN, the overall conclusion is that the settlement of international cultural disputes is also supported by soft law. Soft law, as you may know, refers to rules that are neither strictly binding in nature nor lacking legal significance, such as documents adopted in the context of international organizations, as is the case with the UN General Assembly resolutions, UNESCO recommendations, policy declarations, guidelines, etc. The set documents set principles and provide guidance and standards and if applied by states on an ongoing basis may create opinio juris and thus great potential in terms of exercising moral pressure to states in particular when it is about international cultural disputes. To my view, and I shall conclude with this, the unanimous recognition by a UN General Assembly resolution of the institution of international conferences on the return or restitution of cultural property, as well as of their concluding documents, is a development that constitutes the uncontested victory of the continuous collective efforts of the so-called exporting or source states to achieve return or restitution of their stolen or displaced cultural treasures. In other words, it is a victory of multilateral cultural diplomacy. And cultural diplomacy is definitely a powerful means of international cultural disputes settlement. Thank you. Grazie. Thank you. Thank you very much. Grazie mille. Uh, Artemis, for your very clear considerations on the machineries that we have uh, to settle disputes on the restitution and return of cultural uh, properties. Mm, just uh, two details on the case of the Parthenon sculptors. I'm not competent uh, to discuss uh, this question, which is a very complex one but I would say that uh, it is uh, the, the mother of all the question of restitution of cultural properties because uh, the Parthenon is the emblem of Western civilization. And today we find half of the marbles in London and half of the marbles in Athens. That's a typical examples of cultural properties which are outside their proper context. And uh, I want just to tell you two details which are related to Italy. First uh, detail, Lord Elgin was uh, the British ambassador to the Ottoman Sultan because Greece did not exist at that time as an independent state. 
And he was granted an authorization by the Sultan, by a decree of the Sultan. The original text of the decree has been lost. And we have only a translation in Italian, which was made at the time of enactment of the decree. And uh, I know Italian, I can read Italian, but from the text, I'm not very sure about what rights were granted to Lord Elgin. He was granted the right in Italian di portar via qualche pezzo di pietra, to remove uh, some pieces of stones. So our first question is uh, half of the marbles, do they correspond to some pieces of stone? And was he granted the right to remove the marbles to make pictures of them? Or was he granted a, a right to remove the marbles to take them away from Greece to uh, London? And then the second uh, detail is that perhaps you don't know that a small fragment of the Parthenon marbles is in Italy. It is exhibited in the Regional Archaeological Museum of Palermo because it was given by Lord Elgin to the British Consul in Palermo and then by the Consul to the University of Palermo and then to the museum. So if our position is that the Parthenon marble should be given back uh, to Greece, uh, we should be consistent and we should give back to Greece also the fragment that is in Palermo. Good. N now we, we move uh, uh, to our third uh, uh, speaker and uh, he is uh, Mr. Frank Lord. He is a partner of a law firm in New York, Herrick Feinstein, and they are very much involved in litigations relating to cultural uh, properties. And he will speak about mediation and conciliation in disputes relating to cultural properties. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you all for having me. Um, my partner, Larry Kay, was originally supposed to be here today. Unfortunately, he could not make it, but he asked me to send his regards. Um, I will speak in his place. Um, in general, I'll be speaking about the role of mediation in cultural property disputes. Um, and we've heard about a number of specialized kinds of um, mediation programs that have been developed at UNESCO and ICOM. Um, there's also, I just want to mention, uh, a new one, the Court of Arbitration for Art in The Hague, uh, which started last year. I'm not sure that they've done any cases yet. But I think there is a general sense that um, ADR can be used successfully in cultural property cases. Um, and I'm an, I'm an advocate for that. Um, I've personally settled more than 60 cases of cultural property disputes uh, through negotiation. Uh, but mediation is a little bit of a different story. And um, I think what we'll see is that it has its uses and, and, and may not be useful in other cases. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to focus primarily on the United States and cases in the United States. And what, what I hope to show is that there are potential benefits and limitations of mediation as a path toward resolution of these disputes. Um, to that end, I'm going to discuss some recent disputes and, um, and how future disputes may be handled. But I also want to start by talking about a few uh, earlier disputes and how they have been handled and what has changed or not changed in the handling of cultural property disputes in the United States. Um, one of the most important things uh, that we've seen, particularly in the 20th century, is the development of uh, cultural property laws in source countries that vest ownership of cultural property in the state. Um, that is not something we have in the United States, but in the United States, when you have a cultural property claim from a country that has an ownership law that vests, that vests ownership in the state, 
um, it creates a, a very important distinction, and I think it's distinct from the way these claims can be handled sometimes in Europe. Um, these, these ownership laws are consistently honored in the United States if they clearly vest ownership in the state. Um, but what's different in the United States from many European jurisdictions is that in the U.S., um, no one, not even a good faith purchaser, can acquire title to stolen property. So if there is a law that vests ownership of the cultural property in the state, it's impossible in the United States to pass good title to that property to a buyer. Um, and what that means is that foreign governments can come to the United States and assert cl claims to cultural property um, as stolen property in violation of their cultural property laws. Um, this, this was first established as a legal principle in the 1970s. There was a very important case um, called U.S. v. McLean, and that was a criminal case where a group of art dealers were criminally prosecuted for bringing pre-Columbian antiquities out of Mexico and into the United States in violation of a Mexican cultural property law. And uh, they, they went to jail. Um, and the, the court ruled that notwithstanding the fact that Mexico never had physical possession of, these property, of this property because uh, they were dug out of the ground, that they were nonetheless vested, ownership was nonetheless vested in the state. Um, and this was reconfirmed in 2003. There was a very important decision in a, in a case called U.S. v. Frederick Schultz. Uh, Frederick Schultz was a prominent antiquities dealer in New York, and he sold a number uh, or attempted to sell a number of Egyptian antiquities that he had conspired to smuggle out of Egypt, and uh, he was actually sent to jail um, because he had violated Egypt's cultural property ownership law. Um, and it was a few years after the McLean decision that uh, Mr. K, who would have been here today, was originally retained by the Republic of Turkey to help recover some objects um, from what is known as the Lydian Horde. Um, let me see if I can. Um, this is a group of uh, about 400 objects from the 6th century BC uh, that were created by craftsmen from the Lydian, Phrygian, and Euritanian civilizations. Um, I'll give just a couple examples. Um, th these are just extraordinary objects. And these had been acquired by the Metropolitan Museum, uh, and a claim was presented to the museum. The museum essentially said, go away, and um, it turned into a litigation. And the case went on for many years. Uh, there were three years of litigation just over the statute of limitations question. Um, and then once that was, uh, that the motion to dismiss on statute of limitations was dismissed, um, there were several years of discovery, and um, it took it took until 1993, and the case went on. I think the case was originally filed in 1989 um, until the museum agreed to give the property back, and that was short of trial. And one of the things that that probably drove that decision was in discovery. It came out that the minutes of the acquisition committees. Um, when these objects were purchased, actually stated that they had been recently unearthed in Turkey right before they were acquired by the museum. Um, so, the, so the Metropolitan Museum fought this case for 14 years, knowing that it had documents in its possession that said that it, they, these objects had been illegally removed from Turkey. Um, but before that case even was even resolved, there was another case that was started. Um, this was the Omali Horde case. Um, uh, and this involved uh, a group of coins that appeared on the market, um, and, and crucially, these Athenian decadrons will be are important in this. Um, this case was brought in 1989, um, before the, the other case at the Metropolitan Museum was resolved. And it, there were hundreds of coins in this in this hoard that suddenly appeared on the market, and the decadrams were a critical part of that because there had only been I think two dozen kn known to exist before, and suddenly double that number existed. Uh, this whole group appeared out of nowhere that had been undocumented. 
Um, and these objects had been um, purchased by a billionaire um, and a, an associated group um, called OKS Partners. Uh, the billionaire was uh, William Koch, uh, who died recently. Um, the case was litigated again for 10 years. Um, it resolved in 1999, only after a court decision denying four motions to dismiss um, and several years of discovery. And ultimately, there was clear evidence that um, these coins had been illegally removed from Turkey and that they, the purchasers had likely known when they bought them. Um, the, dec the decadroms were, were important there, too, because they actually managed to find um, some of the thieves, and they were able to identify these coins as objects they had dug up out of the ground because they were of their distinctive um, look. Um, now, our, our firm has done a number of cultural property cases, and, and these are just two, uh, two examples and two relatively early examples at that. Um, but I wanted to use them because they're different in that one involves a museum and the other involves uh, private collectors. And in the years that have followed, there have been significant changes in the way that some cultural property claims are handled in the United States. Um, the result has been that many artifacts uh, have been returned without the need for litigation. Um, but you see that more often in the case of museums than you do with private collectors. Uh, and we've heard a lot about things that have been returned, and I was going to list a bunch of them, but they've already been discussed today. Um, I'll just note, um, you know, in 2006, the Metropolitan Museum agreed to return 21 objects to Italy, including the Euphronius Crater. Um, the Getty Museum uh, returned a number of antiquities to Greece. Uh, the Museum of Fine Arts also returned antiquities to Italy. Um, all of those happened in t one year in 2006. Um, the Cleveland Museum of Art uh, has also returned antiquities to Italy. Um, and uh, the Boston Museum of Fine Arts returned to Turkey in 2011, um, the uh, so-called Wary Heracles. And this was a sculpture that had, um, it had been known uh, on the market since the early 90s, and Turkey had made a claim for it because it was, when it was dug up, it was apparently broken in half, and looters got the top half, but the bottom half remained in Turkey. And so when it came on the market, uh, the Republic of Turkey said, well, it had to come from Turkey. We have the other half of it. Um, but the, um, uh, the Boston Museum of Fine Arts nevertheless uh, refused to return it for almost 20 years. Um, and that, that, despite the fact that um, about halfway through that period, uh, they actually made plaster casts of both pieces and put them together in the same room, and they fit like the pieces of the same puzzle. Um, but nonetheless, it took the, the MFA a while to move on that. Um, and there have been more returns in recent years. Uh, the Metropolitan Museum, interestingly, has uh, returned in just the last few years artifacts to Egypt, Italy, Nepal, and Cambodia. Um, not, that doesn't mean to say that all of these claims are resolved uh, happily or with, without um, long, long disputes. Uh, I was just going to mention the Getty um, and the uh, Lesippus bronze, but it's actually on our, um, right there. Um, and uh, so... Well, those are museum examples, examples where museums have agreed to return things, but examples with private collectors have been a little different. And I think that there's a good example just from the last few years in the United States that shows how museums and private collectors have been dealing with these claims very differently. Um, there, was, there was a group of uh, Khmer sculptures uh, from a temple called Prasat Chen in northern Cambodia. And uh, there were, I think, um, five uh, statues that were taken from the temple complex and ultimately located in the United States. Um, and they resulted in a series of claims. Uh, the first was in, against Sotheby's in 2011. And this sculpture was to be auctioned at Sotheby's um, when the Cambodian government came forward and made a claim, and it was 
it was taken out of the auction at the very last minute. But what the Cambodian government uh, pointed out was that this sculpture was missing its feet, and the feet were actually still in the ground of the temple in Cambodia, um, and they matched. So it was hard to argue that it wasn't removed from Cambodia. Um, uh, then nonetheless, the, the Sotheby's did not um, immediately return the statue. It was on auction from a private collection, and um, negotiations to have the statue return failed. That was in 2011. The next year, uh, the Cambodian government located two other figures in the Metropolitan Museum, and these were from the same temple complex. And the Metropolitan Museum uh, had had these in their collection since 1994. Um, but, oh, and then there were additional, um, additional statues from the same group that were located um, this one had been sold at Christie's in 2009, so before the Sotheby's sale. Um, this one was from the Norton Simon Museum of Art, and this one from the Cleveland Museum of Art, and uh, this one from the Denver Museum of Art. And so ultimately all of these pieces were returned to Cambodia, but the approaches that were taken to dealing with them were different. Um, in this case of Sotheby's, when negotiations failed, um, the U.S. attorney for the Southern District of New York initiated an action seeking the civil forfeiture of the sculpture. And Sotheby's and its consigner responded with a vigorous defense. They argued that Cambodia did not have a clear cultural patrimony law giving it ownership over the statue, or that if it did, um, they had waived it by failing to enforce it. Uh, they argued that there was no evidence that this um, statue left Cambodia after the cultural property law went into effect. And they also argued that the, the consigner was a good faith purchaser for value and therefore had good title to the statue under British law. So the argument was that it had been purchased in good faith in, in some place where, in a jurisdiction where title would pass to a good faith purchaser. Um, in 2013, the court denied Sotheby's motion to dismiss the action. Um, while Sotheby's proceeded with litigation, the Metropolitan Museum decided to investigate and negotiate. And after working closely with Cambodian officials uh, over a period of months and sending some high-ranking representatives from the museum to Cambodia, the museum concluded that the two statues they had had um, had in fact been looted, and in 2013, in May 2013, while the suit against Sotheby's was still pending, um, the Metropolitan Museum agreed to return these two statues. And when asked about the museum's decision uh, to return those statues, uh, Sotheby's told the New York Times, the Met's voluntary agreement does not shed any light on the key issues in our case. Um, ultimately, Sotheby's and its consigner settled the case. They agreed to return the statue in their possession without any compensation. In December 2013, after almost two years of hard-fought and undoubtedly very expensive litigation, about six months later, having seen the example of Sotheby's and the Met, uh, Christie's agreed to return the piece that it had previously sold. It actually repurchased the piece from the buyer and returned it to Cambodia. And then the Norton Simon Museum, the Cleveland Museum, and the Denver Museum also ultimately returned their artifacts um, without litigation or compensation. Um, the dis significant distinction is, betwe is between the responses to the first two claims. Sotheby's responded with lit rejection and litigation, and the Metropolitan Museum investigated and decided to the appropriate thing to do was return the statues in its collection a choice that the three other um, museums also made. Um, Christie's, unlike Sotheby's, did agree to return the statue that it had sold, but only after it had seen the U.S. government bring an action against Sotheby's and see Sotheby's decide to settle. Um, so in sum, when faced with a claim, a private collector who was interested in selling a statue chose litigation as a strategy, and by contrast, the museums chose to return the statues without the need for litigation after having used negotiation as a strategy. And this is a pattern that we've seen continue in the United States. Um, in April 2014, the Metropolitan Museum identified a sculpture of a bull's head 
um, that was actually on loan from a private collector, so it was not part of the museum's collection. Um, and they identified it as a piece that had likely been stolen from Lebanon during that country's civil war in the 1980s. And according to allegations made by the Manhattan District Attorney's Office in connection with an application to seize this sculpture while it was at the museum, the museum had identified the sculpture as likely having been looted and the lender was notified that the museum intended to contact the Lebanese government about the piece. The owner's attorney objected to the museum notifying any uh, governmental official about this sculpture, uh, but the museum went ahead nevertheless and notified the Lebanese government in December 2016. A claim followed in 2017, as did an investigation by the district attorney's office, and the district attorney's office notified the collectors who owned, owned the piece that it would likely be seized, but before a warrant for the seizure could be issued, the collectors filed an action to stop it from being issued in federal court in New York. Um, litigation continued for several months until the collectors received what their attorney described as incontrovertible evidence that the sculpture had been looted, at which point they withdrew their lawsuit and the, and the sculpture was returned to Lebanon. Uh, there, there are a number of other cases that I could cite, including one that is currently being litigated by my firm. But this one example is, I think, enough to make the crucial point, which is that an important difference between a museum and a private collector is that the private collector is more likely to view a piece of cultural property as an asset with monetary value. And um, this certainly this was true of the collectors who had purchased the bull's head. Um, they identified the purchase and sale of antiquities as their primary business. And another difference is that accommodations that are sometimes made between museums returning property and government claimants, particularly agreements for future loans of objects similar to those being returned, won't satisfy the needs of a collector who thinks in terms of monetary value, um, even if um, that kind of resolution was politically palatable. Thus, from the collector's point of view, there are intractable issues that make settlement through mediation, which typically requires compromises by both parties, unappealing. Claimant governments face similar impediments to mediation when faced with a piece of cultural property that has been removed from within its borders in violation of a cultural patrimony law that makes the government the owner of the property, it is difficult to find some place to compromise. Similarly, there are difficulties with offering a monetary reward for the return of stolen cultural property uh, because that's, that solution might satisfy private collectors, but it would also encourage more thefts. Um, of course, cultural property is also viewed as having intrinsic value to the country from which it was removed. Um, this too makes any option other than the outright return of cultural property difficult to contemplate, um, as does the emotional attachment that is often part of cultural property disputes. So both claimants to uh, and private collectors holding cultural property are, start generally and, and end in sort of intractable positions. It is in the collector's economic interest to fight the, to stop the return of the cultural property that they have required, and it is in the claimant government's interest to insist on the return of the property as the only solution. Uh, this is why litigation is often used in these disputes, particularly where the monetary value of the property at issue makes the expense of litigation a reasonable one. And, and I'll have to say that I have even seen cases um, that are being litigated where that is not true, where the monetary value of the pieces is low enough to make litigation a poor choice. Um, of course, many of these cases are often resolved short of trial, as were the disputes in the Republic of Turkey v. OKS Partners. Um, the sculpture from the Prasat Chen that was a, in a private collection and the bull's head sculpture. But resolution in these cases will generally occur only after the party in possession is presented with some kind of incontrovertible evidence, perhaps in the form of a court ruling that they are un highly unlikely to win the fight. Other disputes about cultural property are settled through negotiation, which we'll hear about more momentarily. But the negotiated settlements, or at least um, those that I'm aware of, are generally resolved under conditions that make mediation difficult. Um, this is not to say that mediation is impossible or, or necessarily difficult in all cultural property disputes. 
Um, although I am not aware that mediation was used in any of these specific cases that I mentioned, the museum returns that I have listed could well have been mediated, or at least could have benefited from mediation. In each case, there was a possibility of promised loans, joint exhibitions, or some other kind of compromise that could have helped the, the party resolve their disputes. And we do know that um, mediation has been used successfully in some instances. Uh, I have a list here, but we've actually seen almost all the examples so far today. Um, so I'll just end by saying that from the point of view of a practitioner in the United States, um, although it's appealing op- an, uh, an appealing option, mediation may be of limited use in many cultural property disputes. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Lord, for giving us information about how to settle disputes relating to cultural properties in the United States, which finally is uh, the main market of destination of cultural uh, properties. You mentioned the case uh, of the bronze uh, that you find uh, on the badge of our meeting. It has many names, uh, the Getty Bronze, the Victorious Youth, uh, uh, the athlete from Fano. But uh, the, the question is particularly complex because uh, it was not illegally excavated in Italy. It was found uh, on the seabed of the Adriatic Sea beyond the limit of Italian territorial waters. Then it, it was illegally introduced in Italy and then it was illegally exported from Italy and bought by the Paul Getty Museum. So international law of the sea is also involved in the dispute. And uh, there is also another problem that uh, the Italian judicial authorities, they have issued an order of confiscation. And after many litigations, it has been finally confirmed by the Court of Cassation, the highest jurisdiction in Italy. So our question is how many chances we have to execute an Italian order of confiscation in the United States, in California. Uh, but maybe we will discuss it during the, the, the discussion. And uh, now uh, I give uh, the floor to our fourth uh, speaker, Mr. Manlio Frigo. He teaches international law in the University of Milan and uh, is uh, a partner of uh, the law firm Bonelli Erede in Milan. He's an expert in legal questions on cultural properties. He wrote uh, many publications, including uh, the, the text uh, of the course uh, on, of the Ag Academy on, on this uh, subject, which is a, a big uh, volume. Uh, I don't know if I can disclose a detail of our private uh, life. Uh, if you allow me, <laughs> Nothing Mario. Nothing important. We, we both uh, teach in uh, Milan in two different universities. And we believe that we are both experts in uh, law of cultural properties. So we decided to join our efforts and our intelligence in presenting a proposal to the ministry, Italian Ministry of Education on, uh, on, on of culture, of culture, no of culture, culture. on restitution <coughs> of cultural properties. Uh, we asked uh, for a lot of money. We spent a lot of time in preparing a good application. In English. In English. Because and it, uh, it was uh, twice uh, rejected uh, by the ministry. So we don't know if to make uh, now a third attempt uh, on this way, probably not. Terzium so, non dato, right? Yes. <laughs> so you, you have the floor, man. <coughs> thank you, Tullio, thank you. And thanks to the organizer, I'm sorry for my voice, for inviting me <coughs> to take part in this important uh, conference. And I would like to say that being the last one, uh, normally everything is already has already been done and said, so uh, my task is quite easy. In what, and also, I'm supposed to say something about negotiation. 
uh, which is, uh, as I was saying before, all or nothing, because we could spend five days in talking about what negotiation is or telling about gossips or details of how a negotiation can be carried on, or to say, well, negotiation is just negotiation, so it's just a matter of uh, uh, leading a confrontation between two parties, so there's not no much to say. And that's the reason why I prefer to call my, my short presentation negotiation and ADR in cultural property uh, disputes, because it's, of course, strictly linked to uh, other aspects. So first of all, let me just draw your attention on which are the uh, disputes that uh, are concerned in our fields uh, that are interesting to us. First of all, they are or they should be of uh, multidisciplinary nature, which means, which means that not only uh, uh, such a kind of a dispute would need a lawyer, uh, but also maybe an art historian, maybe an archaeologist, maybe other kind of uh, uh, knowledge, uh, of human knowledge. Uh, second, the parties that may be involved, we heard this morning from our friend Attila Tansi, that we may have a different set of combination between privates and and, and public bodies involved uh, uh, with different with different uh, combinations in, in a, a dispute. And then, third, uh, normally what is interesting to us, at least from an international lawyer viewpoint, is that these kind of disputes are uh, have cross-border implications. But it is also true that there, there are a number of situations that are called them drawbacks of lawsuit, because the first choice normally is to go to court be it a civil or a criminal procedure, of course, in the second case, it's obvious that you go to court. You're called to, you're not, you, I mean, it's not your uh, choice, maybe. But normally, the first choice, statistically, is that you go to court. But sometimes, litigation may prove uh, inappropriate uh, as a way to solve these kind of disputes, uh, because it may entail effects, negative effects on professional relationships between maybe, you can imagine, a dispute between a museum and a, and a foreign country. Uh, or uh, frequently you, you also have to consider the uncertainty of the outcome. That's already been said today. This is a field where it's particularly difficult to forecast which the out outcome of a dispute will be because it depends on a number of different factors such as which uh, the applicable law would be, uh, which the private international law rule would be applied, how the same rule, like uh, the uh, Lex Ray seat, the, the, the law of the place where the uh, item is situated, is interpreted in the different jurisdictions. Then you have what Tullio Scovazzi was mentioning uh, a few minutes ago. You may have to face problem of enforcement of a judicial decision in a foreign jurisdiction. Who knows? It depends on the existence on, uh, of uh, um, international agreements in this. Uh, can. And also you have add that apart from the case of inconveniency, you have cases where a lawsuit is not a viable option because uh, you have cases where you have to face with a lack of jurisdiction, where you have no jurisdiction where to, to, to claim an object, for instance, and you have to face problems such as the expiry of the uh, limitation period. In those cases, you don't have choice. I mean, you cannot go to court. Uh, and uh, uh, as a matter of fact, uh, many says that there are some positive uh, benefits, some positive, in, in the choosing some ADR solution uh, like uh, uh, mediation, like negotiation, which is anyway a part of each of these uh, ADR systems, or conciliation or arbitration if, poss is, if possible. First of all, parties may estimate, I, I go very, very quick because this is, a, uh, I, I don't want to steal part of the next presentation, but as you all know, in these cases, you also have the choice of law, location, and language, which is not a detail in a, a number of international disputes related to <clears throat> cultural property and art. You may exert a choice of the expert uh, uh, 
you may you may choose not only the lawyer who is an expert, but also, uh, for instance, an arbitrator who is an expert and not, and not somebody who doesn't know anything or almost anything about the matter. Uh, there's a matter also of a flexibility of time efficiency uh, of, or for instance, an arbitration if compared to the choice of going before a court, particularly if it's an Italian court. Confidentiality is also another issue that is frequently taken into consideration, and the variety of remedies, which means uh, that it's not black or white, it's not that somebody who loses and somebody who is uh, convicted or somebody who, who is the winner, but you may have different solutions uh, by, for instance, a mediation or a conciliation. Uh, but here, just for you to have a, an overview, let's consider how many fields or sectors may be, uh, may be concerned by an international dispute. You see, these are some of the main sectors all concerning art, law, or cultural property issues that may be of some interest uh, as far as uh, disputes are concerned. Now, let me just draw your attention on a couple of them because, of course, insurance, reproduction, loan, resale rights, all things that were mentioned today. But I understand that today we are pointing our attention basically, at least in our panel, on two sectors which are restitution and return that uh, our team has explained very well uh, are two different faces of the uh, of the same problem uh, let me just add that to, to her definition of restitution and return which was very clear that the case of return uh, not only implies the the, the, the definition that our team has gave us but you also have to add uh, cases uh, when a, a government a country a state uh, ask for the return of a cultural item that was not state property, that was illicitly exported, but that has become state property because, for instance, uh, there is a confiscation uh, that makes it possible that the state becomes the owner. The state was not the original owner. This is a case which is not very easily accepted for many, from many jurisdictions, which is an additional problem that maybe uh, helps us to understand why ADR is uh, uh, alternative dispute resolution are sometimes to be preferred to the simple fa mere fact of going before a refer the case uh, uh, to a court. Uh, of course, you also have to take into consideration the nature of the claims that basically, and this is clear in our case of restitution and return, may be, as I, I use a very, very broad distinction, contractual or non-contractual. And let's say that normally when we deal with restitution or return cases, we are in the second half of the definition, which makes it much more difficult to uh, let the parties of such a dispute to make a choice, for instance, for an arbitration. It's very difficult that uh, if you have, don't have a contractual relation, you make this kind of a choice. Uh, let me say that uh, this has already been said, but it, Let's look at, at this phenomenon from another viewpoint. Uh, there is an institutional level which is of some interest. In, uh, what I want to say is that uh, many important international organizations, bodies, institutions, both uh, international, intergovernmental, um, national, private, or, or public, uh, that uh, suggests uh, parties of this kind of a dispute to use ADR uh, methods of uh, um, dispute resolution. The first uh, example has already been mentioned uh, at the UNESCO level, which is an intergovernmental body. Uh, a second example is WIPO, the uh, International Organization for um, uh, Intellectual Property, uh, and with its International and Mediation Center in Geneva. Uh, ICOM WIPO, this is a combined uh, uh, effort between WIPO, which is an international organization, and ICOM, which is not, which is only a private as association, even if uh, very important in, in the operating at an international level, uh, that established in 2012 this art and cultural heritage mediation. Uh, let me just add 
an example, I'm sorry to, to mention this case here because I wouldn't want to, that this may be taken as a competition because we are uh, in, in the seat of the Chamber of Commerce of Florence and I'm mentioning an initiative of another Chamber of Commerce. But this is an interesting example. Uh, as you probably know, the Milan Chamber of Commerce established a mediation in art uh, um, um, center in, in starting uh, from 2015. And this is interesting because probably nobody, not many people know that, that uh, uh, unlike the ICOM WIPO initiative, uh, and I can tell you because I'm also an advisor of, of uh, ICOM, of the Legal Affairs Committee, and we have problems in uh, with, with um, deciding whether or not to go on with this experience because we didn't have a case. Uh, on the other hand, if you look at the experience of the Milan ADR in art, they, I think they have more than 40 cases. Uh, they have dealt with uh, more, and it is true that more, most of them are national, domestic cases. And it is also true that under Italian law, mediation is compulsory for a certain number of disputes. But this is interesting as an experience, which means that we need this kind of activity. So uh, these new agreements between the Chamber of Commerce of Florence and the, and the, the um, Court of Arbitration in the Hague is welcome because hopefully this also will open uh, the, uh, the, the, the floor to new um, um, collaboration in order to solve these kind of international disputes. And there, as you know, there is this very, very recent new institution that uh, dates uh, 2018, but which is only active as from April 2019, the Court of Arbitration for Art in the in the Egg. Now, also from the viewpoint uh, of the international conventions involved, some of these conventions that were already mentioned many times this morning and in the afternoon uh, do uh, provide for a suggestion at least to use some ADR method such as arbitration, as is, is the case of the 1954 uh, co um, convention and of the Unidra convention, or mediation, as is the case of the 2001 UNESCO convention on the protection of the underwater cultural uh, heritage, and also at the European Union level, uh, one of the most recent initiatives, which is the, the recast of the previous directive, this directive 2014-60 on the uh, return of cultural objects illicitly removed from another member state, provide for an arbitration procedure, as you see. So, uh, of course, we have to deal with the nature of the claims and the part involved, but I would like to, to, to come to the second part of my presentation. These are some standard uh, clauses that are suggested by some uh, um, uh, international institutions. The first one is not a specialized in art law uh, disputes, the ICC, of, well known, of course. The second one is specialized, uh, even though we don't know if they really are dealing with some cases or not. But uh, this is the, the Arbitration and Mediation Center WIPO uh, clause. But let me now tell you something about really negotiation in art, sorry. Uh, you have already heard today, basically from Francesco Rutelli and other speakers, uh, mention has been made also by Frank uh, Lord in the last intervention, uh, mention to these agreements. Uh, well, you know that uh, Italy uh, entered, in, the Italian government entered into some agreements with some foreign institutions. These are just some of the agreements, but as I took part as an advisor to some of these agreements, maybe I can contribute with some uh, description of why did we succeed in uh, in achieving this this difficult task, and and uh, how did did it come that we uh, arrived to s similar solutions? Well, in all these cases, basically there was something that Tansi mentioned this morning: 
there was a parallel activity because there was an ongoing uh, legal proceeding. There was an ongoing request by the Italian government to some foreign institutions to have back some uh, goods that for one reason or another were supposed to have been stolen or looted or whatever uh, from Italy and that should come back. Uh, and of course, in all these cases, all the difficulties that we were mentioning before were very, very clear to both parties. Uh, we don't have to forget, I was, of course, in this, all these cases, in, all, in some of these cases, I was on, acting on behalf of the foreign institutions. So what I can refer is how they also can have a look to this kind of a problem. Uh, whenever a director of uh, an American museum is asked to give back something, as you know, the, in, in the States, as Frank Lord may explain much better than I do, uh, the, the system of the museum systems is quite different from the European continental style. They are not state owned museum, they are normally um, hold by a trust. Uh, and so in this sense, it is difficult for a director to explain, or at least he has to convince the board of trustees of the reason why would they be supposed to give back something that they have bought on the market. You see, so we have to start from this point. And in all these cases, uh, what is interesting is that uh, I would use an, an adjective which is reasonable. The positions of both parties had been reasonable. We took uh, uh, a line which was 90, the year 1970. Why? Because 1970 psychologically, not legally, but it's the date of the signature of the 1970 UNESCO Convention on the means of prohibiting and preventing uh, illicit trafficking in cultural property. So we started from the idea that no museum director after 1970 uh, could not be aware of the fact that there were some international rules, not only ethical but legal, uh, that there was an international standard that would have been respected that started from the UNESCO Convention that was continued by the UNIDRA Convention. So we, our, our common reasoning was to say, well, let's forget about everything happening before 1970, and let's concretely work on everything that was bought legally or illegally after this threshold uh, date. And this is, was a, a very convincing beginning of the negotiations uh, in, in some of these cases. Uh, as you see, there are some of the cases, there are more recent cases, there are the case of uh, the Carlsberg Museum in Copenhagen. Uh, they gave back to Italy some 488 pieces, if I remember correctly, a, a couple of years ago. So, I mean, this is an ongoing process of negotiations. But these are some agreements that share a common structure. Uh, this is a kind of a model that I would like to briefly explain. These are the you have already seen this morning the Euphronius crater that was given back from the Met in 2006. Uh, this is the uh, uh, Morgantina Venus given back by the Getty Museum. Uh, we had besides a, a criminal proceeding in that case, uh, uh, which uh, I have to say was quite different from the case of the uh, Getty bronze that, that was mentioned by Tullio Scovazzi now, because as he was uh, correctly saying, in this recent case, it was not an illicit excavation in Italian territory. It was something that was, uh, that was taken outside the territorial water uh, in Italy. So it's really a difference. Uh, and this is another uh, restitution that I, I was participating directly uh, on behalf of this museum that gave back some in very important items uh, to, to Italy. Uh, and this also uh, was a, a different case because in this case it was not a technically a restitution, it was a donation uh, because the Italian government acknowledged that this museum acted in good faith by purchasing this artwork that was that had been illicitly exported from Italy in 1941, uh, but the museum proved his good faith. But the agreement was reached, and the don and among others uh, uh, engagements, uh, the, um, the donation was affected. Well, w formal features of all these agreements. First of all, they are all, all out of court settlements. Uh, they are of 
technically contractual nature. They are not international agreements, technically speaking. And they all share the same definition. They call themselves long-term cultural cooperation agreement, which means that beyond the problem of restitution or return, you find other obligations of the party, as uh, probably Rutelli said this morning. Uh, you solve with this by these contractual uh, models the a problem which is a problem, which is the applicable law. It is interesting enough to note that some of these agreements does not even mention which is the applicable law. Some of them provide for the application of Italian law, which is something that is not that easy to obtain normally. Uh, and what is also interesting, and I come to the part that is interesting to us, that all these the, the agreements that I was mentioning before share the same uh, uh, close arbitration clause. So in case of disputes on the interpretation or application of each of these agreements, arbitration, so an ADR system, is the uh, way of uh, solving the dispute that has been chosen by the party. Uh, from the material point of view, well, of course, there, we have restitution of objects. The methods was always of negotiating uh, uh, restitution of a certain number of objects out of uh, a more consistent number of objects that were requested from the other party. And uh, they are all long-lasting cultural cooperation agreements. You see the duration of the agreements is, is uh, interesting. 40 years in some cases, 25 uh, years in, in, in other cases. And all these agreements provide for a number of other obligations, such aside uh, the case of restitution, you also have international free loans of equivalent items for four years that might be renewed, removed, renew, renewed for other four years, exchange uh, of professionals and or students between the two parties involved, so the museum, uh, which is, of course, interested in having good relation with the government and the Ministry of Culture of an important country from the archaeological, for instance, viewpoint as Italy. Uh, assistant in research, so the method is to say to this institution, instead of financing, as it was the case of the Getty, uh, illicit excavations, why don't we cooperate and we and you do licit, uh, we, 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 we give you the right of licitly excavating items. Uh, conservation and restoration on agreed terms, as you know, Italian law does not allow uh, that restoration of Italian cultural objects is made, uh, if not under the control of the Italian authorities because of the particular method of restorations. Uh, traveling exhibits that are organized in the frame of all these agreements and they are going on and on all over the years. And I assure that this uh, is a very important uh, example of cooperation, of lasting cooperation from uh, both parties. Uh, well, this, I'm, I'm, I'm really at the end, Antonio. Uh, this is just a, uh, a recommended clause that, uh, that we added in some of these agreements uh, to, in order to avoid uh, a problem that uh, maybe a change of a government could maybe change uh, the uh, choice already made. So there is a waiver of sovereign immunity by the states, by the way, they, they say that accepting the arbitration clause that is, as I was saying before, um, that um, before the ICC in Paris, all these agreements share, uh, at the time there was no specialized international arbitration institution. So ICC, furthermore, is well known. In, I think it's the institution with the major um, number of arbitrations. So it's reliable for both in a foreign institution, Japanese, American, or Danish, and for a government like the Italian one. This was the, the clause that was uh, uh, used as a clause in all these agreements. But let me just end to say that all these agreements show that there is a way to solve even very, very difficult uh, situation of disputes uh, by way of using what uh, I mentioned before, a reasonable attitude uh, by both parties. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Manlio, for having introduced us uh, in your professional experience also as a lawyer involved in uh, many disputes on uh, the restitution of cultural properties. Uh, now, 
I have a doubt, what, what should I do? Uh, we have a delay of uh, one hour and ten minutes. Uh, and uh, should I take into account uh, the interest of the audience in asking right. questions <laughs> to the expert? Yeah. Should I take into account uh, the interest of the future generations of speakers to, to speak today? And uh, <laughs> what, what should I do? I think that we are very late, but we cannot avoid to have a 10 minutes Q&A session. Do you agree? Yes, I agree. <laughs> so 10 minutes of questions. I had a, sharp. a pending question from the session of this morning. I don't know. And then, okay, please, and, and then you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I would like to address a very provocative and interesting point made by Professor Scovazzi at the very beginning of our panel here about instruments, use of instruments and mediation. I would like to mention a new instrument that is giving, when it gets affected fully, will give a lot of power to mediation to help resolve these kinds of disputes as well as others. Um, by the way, my name is Paul Mason. I'm a lawyer, arbitrator, and mediator with the International Mediation Institute, the FIMC here in Firenze, WIPO, and the Singapore International Mediation Center, among others. And speaking of Singapore, this is called the Singapore Convention. And this convention was signed in Singapore August 7th. The first day it was signed by 45 countries, and now there are six more, so we're up to 51 already in a couple of months. What this convention does is it provides for cross-border enforcement of mediated settlement agreements in international commercial disputes. And a lot of these art disputes would qualify under the terms of this convention as commercial disputes, and not even just the ones where art is bought and sold, but in other cases also. Uh, this would raise the status of these mediated agreements beyond mere contractual agreements, which can be uh, respected or ignored by foreign courts at their uh, pleasure, to convention items, which will have to get to the front of the line in the enforcement mechanisms of enforcing countries. Um, this uh, convention was signed by, like I said, 51 countries, important players like US, China, almost all the Middle Eastern countries, which have, a, obviously, in the artifact world, a large role, uh, India as well. Um, the EU did not sign it. I think if Italy wants to be in the forefront of uh, helping mediation settle these kind of disputes, that Italy might think about signing it. Um, now, the enforcement under the convention is in the courts of each country that signed it. And uh, therefore, there may be different procedures for doing it in different countries. Once they're ratified, uh, injunctions may be required for return of property, for example. Um, and finally, there are just two reservations, unlike many international treaties. This one only allows for two reservations to be made by countries if they want to do it. Uh, one is to exclude government uh, instrumentalities from it, and the other one is to require parties to opt into it specifically beforehand. But so far, I think Iran, we were at the signing ceremony, I was a delegate to that. Uh, I think Iran was the only country that made a reservation on the table when they signed it. So uh, I can provide more information about it through the FIMC, anybody wants it. But I think this could be a very uh, interesting tool to give parties more confidence in using mediation because the settlement agreement will have cross-border power, uh, unlike today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, you didn't ask uh, a question. You provided a supplement of information that is very important. Uh, I, I had also, before the intervention by Mrs. Uh, Lozier, uh, that uh, was pending since uh, this morning, and then I come to you and then I close uh, uh, the session. So if you have a, a question, our speakers can answer to both uh, easy and difficult questions. So if you have a difficult question, it's even better. 
Good afternoon. Thank you very much for this wonderful panel, and also the panel from before. These are this morning. So I do have a pending question uh, from the former panel, from Mr. Schoener Wood. Excuse my pronunciation of your last name. But I had a question that had to do with your statement about the absence of claims by African states for objects held in your museum. So uh, you also mentioned the Washington um, principles, which then followed the, Ter the Terrazin de Declaration. But in, in, under the principles and the Terrazin Declarations, there was an allowance to help um, claimants bring their claims uh, to states that now had control over the objects that were looted by the Nazis. So in the state-sponsored offices, uh, claimants have increased their claims, and those claims are increasing um, at, at the moment, even now. Uh, so they, it takes allowance for the difficulties, the challenges of claimants. You mentioned that you have um, a system of claims for the African countries um, to make, to bring grievances. Can you just tell us generally what that um, process is like? And do you take into account any also of the challenges, sometimes realistically difficult challenges that African states may have in bringing such claims? For example, language or understanding of the legal and diplomatic mechanisms, the, the concept of the Universal Museum that um, Professor Skovatsi had mentioned, which is a European um, sense of institution. Uh, what consideration, if any, have you taken into account with your claims procedure? And um, so that's the question I had. So thank you very much. Your question is addressed uh, to Mr. Schonderwood. Is he here? Yes. Uh, while you are thinking about how to answer, I take on board the last uh, question, by, uh, and then we, we close uh, the session. Thank you. Um, my name is Camilla Pereira. I'm Secretary General of the Netherlands Arbitration Institute and also a board member of CAFA, the Court of Arbitration for Art, which was just mentioned by two speakers. Uh, I want to congratulate everyone here on this, uh, on the, the organizers on this uh, event and the speakers on this session particularly. Um, I also want to, wanted to say a quick thanks for mentioning the uh, Singapore Convention because I think that is a, a promising instrument that will that can make a difference in these types of disputes. I just quickly wanted to comment on CAFA because it was mentioned a couple of times in the presentations. Um, so CAFA is the Court of Arbitration for Art. It's a global court. Um, it was uh, established formally last year, but it opened its doors this year. Um, and currently, um, it's a specialist court. And I think the presentations just now, uh, again, emphasize the need to have specialists look at these types of disputes. Uh, we see long and protracted uh, litigations uh, with an uncertain outcome. And that doesn't really uh, serve the markets well. So CAFA is meant to um, provide an answer for that gap. Um, at the moment, we have over 300 applications from specialists from both the art world as well as the arbitration world to sit as arbitrators for CAFA. And we have a selection committee looking at that list of experts. We also have a list of technical experts who are able to provide expert witness support uh, in the arbitrations. Um, the big question is, does CAFA have a case yet? I just uh, heard two speakers mention that. Um, I can't uh, go into detail, but I certainly hope that we will be able to administer the first dispute this year. We see a lot of uh, interest by parties in CAFA, uh, but that is, of course, if the dispute doesn't get settled before that time. Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, so we, we still have your answer to, to the question. Thank you very much. Um, actually, it is true that the Washington Principles uh, require from all parties to give access to information to make claimants, uh, make it possible for them to know what they can actually claim. And it's very often remarked that museums are reluctant to provide that information. We are, we are not. So our whole collection is online, which is one of the problems sometimes that African uh, claimants or other countries don't even know what we hold. 
but uh, you can assess our whole collection through our collection's website, which is for everyone to uh, assess. Also, if a potential claimant would uh, uh, contact us and notify that he or she would be interested to find out what we have and whether or not there's something that he or she would want to claim, we would welcome them and support them and, and do uh, um, maybe even the research together. Because we, we think that this whole procedure is about dialogue. It's about working together. It's not a one against one another uh, way of, of dealing with this. Um, and uh, so we would provide that information, work, work together and support people, uh, nation states or communities in actually coming forward with a, with a claim. Um, that's also why in our framework we make so specific what we consider a claim, uh, what, what, a, uh, what sort of requirements a claim should have. Sometimes you get a letter like, we would like to ask this or that object back, uh, period. Uh, and then a signature. Uh, that's, a, uh, that's a difficult claim to assess. So we need some information. We need uh, a clear position of who is the claimant, uh, which is very often very difficult, uh, why this person claims it. So we have all clarified those requirements uh, in also in order to help them to come forward with a claim that we can seriously then take into procedure. I hope I answered your question. Thank you very much. Uh, one question more to, to one of the speakers. No, so I, I had my, my question, ca can we enforce an Italian confiscation in the United States? That's an interesting question. I don't know that an attempt has been made yeah, as far as I know, no one has filed a case against the Getty to try to enforce that judgment. Um, I'm sure it would be interesting to find out. <laughs> I think there is an international agreement, bilateral agreement between the states and, uh, and Italy, which in principle admits uh, confiscation uh, even if the crime is not considered a crime in the country where in the other country. This in principle, which doesn't mean that a request of confiscation that I confirm as, to my knowledge, has not yet been presented, will be accepted. So I thank everybody for the participation, for the interventions, and also the audience for listening to, to, to the intervention. And uh, unfortunately, we live under the pressure of time and we have to stop now and have the coffee break and then resume. Thank you again. Thank you.